The Crucible, a play by Arthur Miller, an introduction. A note on the historical accuracy of this play. This play is not history in the sense in which the word is used by the academic historian. Dramatic purposes have sometimes required many characters to be fused into one. The number of girls involved in the crying out has been reduced. Abigail's age has been raised. While there were several judges of almost equal authority, I have symbolized them all in Hathorne and Danforth. However, I believe that the reader will discover here the essential nature of one of the strangest and most awful chapters in human history. The fate of each character is exactly that of his historical model, and there is no one in the drama who did not play a similar, and in some cases, exactly the same role in history. As for the characters of the persons, little is known about most of them, excepting what may be surmised from a few letters, the trial record, certain broadsides written at the time, and references to their conduct in sources of varying reliability. They may, therefore, be taken as creations of my own, drama to the best of my ability in conformity with their known behavior, except as indicated in the commentary I have written for this text. Act 1. An Overture A small upper bedroom in the home of Reverend Samuel Paris, Salem, Massachusetts, in the spring of the year 1692. There is a narrow window at the left. Through its leaded panes, the morning sunlight streams. A candle still burns near the bed, which is at the right. A chest, a chair, and a small table are the other furnishings. At the back, a door opens on the landing of the stairway to the ground floor. The room gives up an air of clean spareness. The roof rafters are exposed and the wood colors are raw and unmellowed. As the curtain rises, Reverend Paris is discovered kneeling beside the bed, evidently in prayer. His daughter Betty Paris, aged 10, is lying on the bed inert. At the time of these events, Paris was in his middle forties. In history, he cut a villainous path, and there is very little good to be said for him. He believed he was being persecuted wherever he went, despite his best efforts to win people and God to his side. In meeting, he felt insulted if someone rose to shut the door without first asking his permission. He was a widower with no interest in children or talent with them. He regarded them as young adults, and until this strange crisis, he, like the rest of Salem, never conceived that the children were anything but thankful for being permitted to walk straight, eyes slightly lowered, arms at the sides, and mouths shut until bidden to speak. His house stood in the town, but we today would hardly call it a village. The meeting house was nearby, and from this point outward, toward the bay or inland, there were a few small windowed dark houses snuggling against the raw Massachusetts winter. Salem had been established hardly forty years before. To the European world, the whole province was a barbaric frontier inhabited by a sect of fanatics who, nevertheless, were shipping out products of slowly increasing quantity and value. No one can really know what their lives were like. They had no novelists and would not have permitted anyone to read a novel if one were handy. Their creed forbade anything resembling a theater or vain enjoyment. They did not celebrate Christmas, and a holiday from work meant only that they must concentrate even more upon prayer. Which is not to say that nothing broke into the strict and somber way of life. When a new farmhouse was built, friends assembled to raise the roof, and there would be special foods cooked and probably some potent cider passed around. There was a good supply of ne'er-do-wells in Salem who dallied at the shovelboard in Bridget Bishop's tavern. 
Probably more than the creed, hard work kept the morals of the place from spoiling, for the people were forced to fight the land like heroes for every grain of corn, and no man had very much time for fooling around. That there were some jokers, however, is indicated by the practice of appointing a two-man patrol, whose duty was to walk forth in the time of God's worship to take notice of such as either lie about the meeting house, without attending to the word and ordinances, or that lie at home or in the fields without giving good account thereof, and to take the names of such persons, and to present them to the magistrates, whereby they may be accordingly proceeded against. This predilection for minding other people's business was time-honored among the people of Salem, and it undoubtedly created many of the suspicions which were to feed the coming madness. It was also, in my opinion, one of the things that a John Proctor would rebel against, for the time of the armed camp had almost passed, and since the country was reasonably, although not wholly, safe, the old disciplines were beginning to rankle. But, as in all such matters, the issue was not clear-cut, for danger was still a possibility, and in unity still lay the best promise of safety. The edge of the wilderness was close by, the American continent stretched endlessly west, and it was full of mystery for them. It stood dark and threatening over their shoulders night and day, for out of it Indian tribes marauded from time to time and Reverend Paris had parishioners who had lost relatives to these heathen. The parochial snobbery of these people was partly responsible for their failure to convert the Indians. Probably they also preferred to take land from heathens rather than from fellow Christians. At any rate, very few Indians were converted, and the Salem folk believed that the virgin forest was the devil's last preserve, his home base, and the citadel of his final stand. To the best of their knowledge, the American forest was the last place on earth that was not paying homage to God. For these reasons, among others, they carried about an air of innate resistance, even of persecution. Their fathers had, of course, been persecuted in England, so now they and their church found it necessary to deny any other sect its freedom, lest their new Jerusalem be defiled and corrupted by wrong ways and deceitful ideas. They believed, in short, that they held in their steady hands the candle that would light the world. We have inherited this belief, and it has helped and hurt us. It helped them with the discipline it gave them. They were a dedicated folk, by and large, and they had to be to survive the life they had chosen or been born into in this country. The proof of their belief's value to them may be taken from the opposite character of the first Jamestown settlement, farther south in Virginia. The Englishmen who landed there were motivated mainly by a hunt for profit. They had thought to pick off the wealth of the new country and then return rich to England. They were a band of individualists and a much more ingratiating group than the Massachusetts men. But Virginia destroyed them. Massachusetts tried to kill off the Puritans, but they combined. They set up a communal society which, in the beginning, was little more than an armed camp with an autocratic and very devoted leadership. It was, however, an autocracy by consent, for they were united from top to bottom by a commonly held ideology whose perpetuation was the reason and justification for all their sufferings. So, their self-denial, their purposefulness, their suspicion of all vain pursuits, their hard-handed justice were altogether perfect instruments for the conquest of this space so antagonistic to man. 
But the people of Salem in 1692 were not quite the dedicated folk that arrived on the Mayflower. A vast differentiation had taken place, and, in their own time, a revolution had unseated the royal government and substituted a junta, which was at this moment in power. The times, to their eyes, must have been out of joint, and to the common folk must have seemed as insoluble and complicated as do ours today. It is not hard to see how easily many could have been led to believe that the time of confusion had been brought upon them by deep and darkling forces. No hint of such speculation appears on the court record, but social disorder in any age breeds such mystical suspicions. And when, as in Salem, wonders are brought forth from below the social surface, it is too much to expect people to hold back very long from laying on the victims with all the force of their frustrations. The Salem tragedy, which is about to begin in these pages, developed from a paradox. It is a paradox in whose grip we still live, and there is no prospect yet that we will discover its resolution. Simply, it was this. For good purposes, even high purposes, the people of Salem developed a theocracy, a combine of state and religious power whose function was to keep the community together and to prevent any kind of disunity that might open it to destruction by material or ideological enemies. It was forged for a necessary purpose and accomplished that purpose, but all organization is and must be grounded on the idea of exclusion and prohibition. just as two objects cannot occupy the same space. Evidently, the time came in New England when the repressions of order were heavier than seemed warranted by the dangers against which the order was organized. The witch hunt was a perverse manifestation of the panic which set in among all classes when the balance began to turn toward greater individual freedom. When one rises above the individual villainy displayed, one can only pity them all, just as we shall be pitied some day. It is still impossible for man to organize his social life without repressions, and the balance has yet to be struck between order and freedom. The witch hunt was not, however, a mere repression. It was also, and as importantly, a long overdue opportunity for everyone so inclined to express publicly his guilt and sins under the cover of accusations against the victims. It suddenly became possible, and patriotic and holy, for a man to say that Martha Corey had come into his bedroom at night and that, while his wife was sleeping at his side, Martha laid herself down on his chest and nearly suffocated him. Of course it was her spirit only, but his satisfaction at confessing himself was no lighter than if it had been Martha herself. One could not ordinarily speak such things in public. Long-held hatreds of neighbors could now be openly expressed and vengeance taken despite the Bible's charitable injunctions. Landlust, which had been expressed before by constant bickering over boundaries and deeds, could now be elevated to the arena of morality. One could cry witch against one's neighbor and feel perfectly justified in the bargain. Old scores could be settled on a plane of heavenly combat between Lucifer and the Lord. Suspicions and the envy of the miserable toward the happy could and did burst out in the general revenge. Reverend Paris is praying now, and though we cannot hear his words, a sense of his confusion hangs about him. He mumbles, then seems about to weep, 
then he weeps, then prays again. But his daughter does not stir on the bed. The door opens and his Negro slave enters. Tituba is in her forties. Paris brought her with him from Barbados, where he spent some years as a merchant before entering the ministry. She enters as one does who can no longer bear to be barred from the sight of her beloved, but she is also very frightened because her slave sense has warned her that, as always, trouble in the house eventually lands on her back. <laughs>